when we ask big questions like, what are the chances of life appearing in the universe? There are all sorts of very, very interesting paths and caveats and assumptions. That's why things like the Drake equation are, I'm going to be bold here, are pretty much useless. Uh, that's actually another show. If, if you want me to dig into the Drake equation and why it's like one, not really an equation, and two, it's it's not very useful, feel free to ask. I'd be happy to do it. Uh, but this is like one example of why the Drake equation can be misleading. Because we want to know, we want to know, red dwarf stars, the most common kind of star in the universe, do they host planets with life on them? It's an honest question. It's a valid question. It's a science question. It's something we can answer. Uh, but as a quick little aside about astronomical jargon and terminology, you may have also heard the term M dwarf. Like, oh, we just found a star, and it hosts a bunch of planets. We found a, a red M dwarf star. I don't know who's talking right now, but it's somebody. Uh, to, to give you a little bit of clarity on what that classification means, uh, back in the day, like the late 1800s, when we were going nuts cataloging different kinds of stars, we would observe stars, we would take their spectrum, uh, we would write it down, we'd record it, we'd file away, and we wanted to know for each individual star where to file it. Like... Is it like any other stars? We noticed that some stars were more like other stars and some were different. So we started categorizing them based on the presence and strength of, say, a helium line or, or the general spectrum or all sorts of other. Yeah, I mean, you can pretty much pick any classification scheme you want. And they were super arbitrary. Like, okay, uh, this kind we're going to call star kind A. That star over there, okay, it has these spectral lines. It looks like that. That's going to be B. Uh, this one over here looks a little bit different. Oh, it's blue-white. Very pretty. Okay, so that's going to be C. And it's just pretty much arbitrary. And, and we started building up collections of stars. There's lots of A stars, lots of B stars, C stars, M stars, N stars, or whatever. And then there was a very, very cool astronomer named Annie Jump Cannon, who deserves another show on her own. Uh, feel free to ask about her fascinating story, where she was looking at these classifications of stars that were just kind of made haphazardly, ad hoc, uh, just to get the job done. And she noticed some very interesting relationships. She noticed a relationship between stellar classification, like what bucket this particular star was put in, and things that we actually care about, like its temperature and its size. So she took the buckets that mattered to her, and not every bucket mattered to her, like the 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 Y bucket, there's, there's not, nothing interesting in there. That, that was just a classification didn't mean anything physical. It, it wasn't important. So she found a few of the letters that represented buckets that were very, very useful to her. And then she rearranged them to put them in the progression between cool, cool small, cool stars and big stars. And so that's how we end up with things like red dwarf stars are called M dwarfs. Stars like our own sun are called K classification. And then stars that are big and giant and white, bluish and bright, those are called O stars. And of course, there's some classifications and there's some more letters used in there. But that's why it makes zero sense. All right. Why, why would you pick M to represent small red dwarf stars? Because of astronomical history. Anyway, the main question. Do, does life arise around M dwarf stars? And the bad news the bad news when it comes to M dwarf, red dwarf stars, for, or for any life that might try to get a foothold around them, is they're incredibly temperamental. They're incredibly de temperamental, and that's because of the interiors of these stars, of what's going on. Now, these stars are way less bright than the sun. They are much smaller than the sun. You know, they can be as small as the tenth the mass of our sun. That's small. That's a small star. And when you get stars that small, the interior structure changes a bit. So for a star like our sun, you have the nuclear core where all the business is going down. Then there's a layer of 
what we call the radiative zone that's totally dominated by radiation where all the intense light that's being emitted by the core by all those nuclear reactions is just blasting through just just powering on through it's totally dominated by radiation but then that starts to peter out starts to lessen and then we get a region that we call the convective layer the convective layer um does a lot of convection as the name suggests it's hot at the bottom where you have all these high energy photons from the core, from the radiative zone, hitting it from the bottom. And at the top is space. And space is cold. So you have hot on the bottom, cold at the top. It's like a pot of boiling water. If you put a pot of water on a stove, it's hot on the bottom, cold at the top. You get mixing of that fluid. It's called convection. And we can even see the result of the sun literally boiling. We can see convection cells, hot, the little piece of gas that's say down here at the bottom gets heated by that radiative layer just below it, heats up, expands, becomes buoyant, rises up to the surface, reaches the surface. Oh no, it's cold. It's space. It's cold. Uh, gets dense, sinks back down. And so we see this cycling back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. The granules of this, where we see these little bubbles rising to the surface, are about the size of the planet Earth. And it's this interaction between the radiative zone and the convective zone where we see this. But a big chunk of the sun is just totally dominated by radiation, just blasted. There's still gas there, there's still hydrogen, there's still helium, don't get me wrong. But it's just the, the photons, the raw light is just powering through. But in a small star, like an M dwarf, a red dwarf star. The nuclear reactions are much less intense, much less furious, emit, don't emit nearly as much light. And so when the light comes out of the core, they still have cores, there is no radiative zone. There is no zone where the radiation dominates over the, the hydrogen and helium. It goes right to convection. It goes right to convection. So instead of having three layers like our sun, there's just two. There's a core and then the convective layer that's heated at the bottom, cold at the top, and you get these convection cells. That means that the core of the star is much more closely connected to the outermost surface, the surface that touches space. And because there's this much tighter connection, this much, much closer relationship, there's a lot more variability. There's a lot less insulation, I could say, between outer space and the inner core. So if there's any little bit of variability, if there's variability that happens in the core of our sun, it's like tamped down. We don't see it because it's 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 hidden. It's insulated by that thick radiative layer. But in one of these small stars, if, if the core gets temperamental, if it if the nuclear reactions go up a little bit, it's going to show up on the surface immediately. There's a lot more mixing, a lot more intense mixing. These red dwarf stars have giant star spots. They're not sunspots because they're not on the sun. They're star spots that can cover like half the face of the star. That's crazy. Us sunspots are like these little little beady things on the surface of the sun. Imagine a sunspot, you know, half the size of the sun. That's ridiculous, but that's what happens on red dwarfs. So if your life on a planet orbiting a red dwarf star, you might be fine and dandy, and then what? You get blasted. You get blasted by radiation out of nowhere. And high intensity bursts of radiation are kind of bad for life in terms of survivability. Also, because these stars are so small, we want planets in the habitable zone. We want planets where it's not too cold for the water to turn to ice and not too hot for all the water to boil off, where it's just right. And with a much smaller star with a much weaker star, that habitable zone is crammed way in tight, way closer to the star, like closer than Mercury is to our own sun. And... That, in principle, isn't so bad, except one, you're like right, smush right up against the face of that star. So if it's temperamental, if you get some star spots, if it, it if it's variable, you're going to get blasted and you're right there, right next to it, which kind of sucks. And the other thing is, when you put a small object in, order, in orbit around a big thing, it ends up being tidally locked, where the same face always points towards the bigger thing, like the same side of the moon always points towards the earth. 
Is that a problem for life? Yeah, kind of maybe. You don't get regular day-night cycles. One side of the planet is going to be super blasted with heat. The other is going to be in permanent night. Maybe if there's an atmosphere or thick or, or deep oceans that can circulate. I mean, imagine the wind streams on that planet constantly blasting from the sun side to the night side. Um, it's pretty crazy stuff, but it makes makes life as we know challenging because it certainly wouldn't act like the earth, certainly wouldn't look like the earth. So at first blush, life around an M dwarf, red dwarf star is... I don't know, it seems kind of challenging, but red dwarf stars have some things going for them, like the fact that they're the most common star in the universe, by far. So even if the chances of life appearing around one particular star is much, much lower than life appearing around a sun-like star, well, there's so many more chances. There's so many more of these guys, and they live so long. Because their fusion reactions are much less intense, because there's this constant circulation bringing fresh fuel down into the core, they live for t trillions of years. Trillions. Of, I mean, our sun is going to live 10 billion years, five more billion years. It's already halfway through. So the window of time where life can get a foothold, spread, not die, evolve, start making podcasts, you know, the usual progression that's a relatively short window. We only have, our sun only has a few chances, right, for any planet in orbit around it because eventually it'll get too hot, too big, and kill off any life in the outer worlds. But one of these red dwarf stars with a lifetime of trillions of years, life has lots of chances. So life has lots of chances because there's more red dwarf stars in any one particular life. Chance, you know, life might appear all the right chemical combinations for abiogenesis to get life started, and then it gets blasted. And then, you know, a trillion years later, it might try again. And a trillion years later, it might try again, and again, and again, and then finally gain a foothold. And maybe as these small stars age, they start to calm down a little. It's a little bit hard to tell because there aren't exactly any old red dwarf stars around because the universe has only existed for 13.8 billion years. So that's, a, that's another point. Right now, the universe is only 13.8 billion years. Hundreds of billions of years from now, the, the deep future of the universe, you know, the universe is relatively young from, from the perspective of stars. Like our own sun has been around for like 30% the lifetime of the universe. Eventually, the universe will stop being able to produce such big stars like our own sun. There won't be enough big pockets of gas to make stars like that. And so there will only be red dwarf stars. And so maybe... We're in a relatively special epoch where we get to form around a sun-like star, but maybe we're pretty special. Maybe we're pretty unique. Maybe, given the numbers games, given the odds, given the fact that they're the most common star in the universe, given the fact that they have such long lifetimes, given the fact that they will eventually end up dominating, totally dominating, be the only kind of star in the universe, maybe, maybe... That is the going to be, over the long term, the most common home for life. Hard to tell so far. We're, we're working on it, though. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked, please hit like. Feel free to subscribe and support me on patreon.com slash pmsutter. That's how I do all my education and outreach stuff. See you next time.